Hi everyone and welcome to the next episode in our series of secondary market webinars. My name is Stephen Ziff. I'm a partner and the head of investor relations at Collar Capital based in our London office. Now in today's webinar, we're going to be talking about the recent trends in the secondaries market and dare I say bravely, uh, make some forecasts for the coming year. With me again for this webinar are three of my partners, the firm's global head of origination, Francois Aguerre, uh, our head of Asia, Peter Kim, and finally from the US, uh, Paul Lana. Now we all experienced in the secondary market a slowdown in 2020, uh, and there's been a subsequent recovery in the market. And to be fair, it's been incredibly strong. And at $48 billion of transactions closed, the first half of 2021 was the busiest half year on record. And so as we enter Q4, we thought it opportune to share our thoughts, not just on most of the year that's gone uh, behind us, but also our outlook for 2022. And specifically, we're going to cover a number of themes. We're going to obviously talk about uh, GP led transactions, an increasingly dominant part of the market. We'll talk about transaction volumes and pricing. And uh, with Peter, who's joining us, uh, have a bit of a regional deep dive on Asia Pacific. Uh, so, uh, Francois, Peter, and Paul, uh, firstly, thank you for joining me. Before we get started, one piece of housekeeping to you, the audience. Throughout the presentation, you will be able to ask questions. You can do that by using the ask a question button that's in the top left hand corner. Uh, we'll collate those and look to answer as many as we can at the end of the session. Francois, let's start with you. And maybe at a high level, you can talk us through how the market has evolved in the last year. Thank you, Stephen, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, look, I think you mentioned it in your introduction. It's it's fairly straightforward when you analyze uh, 2020 as, as a year for the cigarettes market. The market is down 25% from 80 roughly to 60 billion. And it's down 25% because one quarter was a complete shut off. So Q2, there were very few transactions, if any. Um, but what we saw was that, which is more important for us, was that between Q1 and the second half of the year, the trend of a strong growing market did continue. Total volume in the second half was completely in line with uh, the volumes that we saw in 2019. And uh, as you said briefly as well in your intro, Stephen, uh, the first half of this year is even stronger with an all-time record for a first half of a year. So, uh, so very, uh, very strong, very vigorous rebound of the market. Now, one feature in uh, the first half year's data uh, was around GP led secondaries. And for the very first time, these transactions represented the majority of volumes uh, at just about 60%. So my question, I'm gonna turn to you, Paul, for this one is, what does it mean for the market and what are the implications of the business going forward? Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, look, that's right. I mean, we've seen a, a tremendous increase in the number of GP LEDs that have come to market. If we look at uh, the first half of 21, we saw nearly as much volume in GP LEDs as we saw in all of 2020. Um, so, you know, what, what does that mean for the market? We, we, we have a steady, predictable flow of high quality GPs bringing high quality assets to the secondary market. And, and, and what I think that means is you're going to see a lot of capital continue to enter the market to, to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, you know, what I think it means for the future is, um, you know, GPs are getting comfortable now, now doing this. I don't see that trend, uh, going away anytime soon. We, we saw some GPs that were hesitant to launch their first GP led transaction. And now we see them doing their second, their third, their fourth, and in some cases, even their fifth GP led transaction. So that, that tells me they've become very accustomed to offering liquidity solutions to their LPs. And I, I don't see that trend going away anytime soon. And I think it, it's fair to say that as the GP led segment of the market has become more dominant, there are a couple of themes within that that have also started to evolve. And I'm gonna come back to you again, Paul, on, on two of them. The first one is really the advent of what we've termed single asset secondaries, now a significant part of the market. Um, obviously a slightly different uh, asset profile, lot, lot more concentrated, 
So one question is how to think about those. And secondly, if we look at transaction type, uh, a number of years ago, it was de rigueur to have tender offers. Uh, now they've fallen a little bit more by the wayside and we're seeing the rise very rapidly of continuation funds, uh, which obviously bring lots of challenges around dynamics and alignment. So maybe some thoughts both on sort of asset and also transaction structure as we look at this part of the market. Sure. Um, you know, from, from an asset standpoint, you're right, your, your, your comment is, is accurate, right? We're seeing a lot more single asset GP LEDs or, or simply concentrated GP LEDs. Um, you know, I think that, that, that requires you to have a strong view on the asset. It requires you to have a strong view on the quality of the GP. Uh, it requires the, the buyer to take a view on, on alignment. And I think there's varying degrees of alignment in lots of these transactions. You have to have a view on valuation uh, in terms of both your entry and your exit. So, so when you, you piece all that together, you're, you're likely to have a lot more, uh, uh, a wider range of outcomes in, in these transactions uh, than, than you would if you think about, you know, the historical LP, large LP book that traded on the, on the secondary market, which had a pretty tight range of outcomes and largely the buyers were taking a view on price. Uh, and quality, and, and here there are a lot more variables going in. So, so I think I think that means we we need to be um, very thoughtful about about how we approach that. You need uh, you need deeper teams. You need to um, do more work. You need to be very thoughtful about portfolio concentration. Um, so, I, I think that has has made it uh, a much more interesting market to participate in, uh, and it's given. Um, you know, it's given. It's going to likely lead to a, a wider range of outcomes for the for the participants. Uh, you know, the way we think about it, and if I think about the transactions that we have spent time on and, and will continue to spend time on, our focus has been high quality assets, high quality GPS. Uh, we tend to only engage where we can really get a strong view of alignment, and that alignment is um, we think favorable to the buyer. Um, and, and then we take a view on portfolio concentration. Uh, our bite size is, is relatively consistent. We don't want any single company in our portfolio to represent more than a, a, you know, a single digit percentage of our overall fund. And then we have the opportunity to constantly think about portfolio construction. So we, we, re, we revisit that every week. And I think, um, you know, look, one of the good aspects for us uh, about this, this pretty robust GP led market is it really does give you an opportunity to dial in your portfolio construction um, how you want to, right? So you can think about concentration and we think about various ways of looking at concentration, but we can we can make that, um, we can pursue transactions that we think will be beneficial to that overall portfolio construction uh, in this market. So I, I think that's one attractive aspect that, that is, is for someone like us is very good. And Stephen, on your second question around um, alignment of interests and how we've we've seen the market migrate from uh, tender offers to to GP led continuation funds, it's something that's very important. It's something we spend a, a tremendous amount of time on um, every week at our investment committee. I, I think first and foremost, you need to have a transaction where there is um, uh, transparency. Right? The information is shared is shared amongst all the participants. Uh, the process is run fairly. Um, and, and I think we wouldn't, you know, we, we would only engage in transactions where that exists. And you see most of these transactions will have an advisor in the middle of it, which, which ensures that, um, you know, on the, on the alignment, I mean, it's a different question, right? The GP is both a, a buyer and a seller, right? They're a seller for the fund that is, that is, uh, selling the assets to the continuation fund and they're a buyer for the LPs that are in the continuation fund. So there's an inherent conflict. Um, and, and I think that's something that, that we spend a tremendous amount of time on, right? Is we need to understand, is the GP uh, a net buyer or a net seller? Are they, what, what are the drivers behind why they're doing this transaction? Um, where where um, are they de-risking uh, their exposure to the asset? So, so we spend a lot of time thinking about that and making sure that when we pursue a transaction, uh, as the buyer and as, as, a, as a buyer in that, in that continuation fund that we have strong alignment with the GP in terms of future value creation and future value growth. Great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Francois, I want to turn to you now, um, because with all this talk of uh, GP led transactions and continuation funds, it's very easy to neglect uh, the more traditional LP fund portfolio part of the market. 
Uh, my question to you is, uh, what's happened in that part of the market? Have LP sellers returned to it? You know, who are they? And what are they selling against this market backdrop? I think, I think Stephen, it's a very fair question because all of us, we are probably to some extent influenced or biased also by the coverage, you know, the media coverage of, uh, of our market. If you think about it, it's always more interesting to talk about uh, a GP led, a specific single company um, in a press article compared to, you know, a sovereign fund or a pension fund selling a large portfolio of, of assets. Um, it, is, it is more concrete on, on the GP led side. But when you look at the numbers, what we've seen on our side in the first half of this year, for instance, is that we've screened uh, almost 30 billion, 29 billion of uh, fund portfolios. So clearly the volume is there. Uh, many transactions are taking place, very large transactions uh, included. And, uh, and when you look at people who sell in the market, it's, um, it's always the same uh, type of institutions, large private equity programs uh, who need or who want to continue to have an active management of their private equity portfolio or private asset uh, portfolio more generally as of today, uh, I should say. So, uh, so the sellers uh, remain the same. Um, what we've seen as an evolution a little bit in this part of the market is maybe the composition of those portfolios. Uh, a lot of healthcare and tech, and tech sectors, um, no one would be surprised of that. There's a lot of tailwind uh, there. So, uh, so we've seen many of those uh, companies through portfolios coming to market. In terms of investment strategy as well, uh, a little bit of evolution um, because of both the increased valuations and also probably a little bit of uh, positive trend. Uh, we've seen more venture and growth capital in the fund portfolios and so in proportions, uh, a bit less of, uh, of buyout. Uh, so some rebalancing a little bit uh, within those, um, those investment strategies. Excellent. Uh, Peter, I haven't forgotten about you. Before we come to you and talk more generally about what's happening in the market, uh, I want to just maybe ask Paul for a comment on pricing and just a few observations about how that's evolved uh, since the onset of uh, the pandemic over the last 12 to 18 months. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I, you know, like, I think there's probably two ways to think about pricing. Uh, the, fir the first is a, is, a, is a discount or a premium to the net asset value. Um, and, and I think if we look at that today, secondary transactions in 2021 are pricing around, around 90 cents or, or 90% of, of NAV. That is up from what we saw in 2020, um, but it's not as high as it was uh, pre-pandemic in 2018, 2017. Um, you know, usually you're pricing a secondary transaction off of a reference date. That reference date is usually one or two quarters in the past. When you've got a rising market and you've got, um, I think, fairly robust distributions, you'll tend to see the the uh, discount compress, and that could even lead to to a premium. And I think that's what we're seeing in this market. Um, but it's, it's signs of a healthy secondary market. Um, the other way to think about valuation, of course, is just the absolute valuation of the marks that is in the underlying funds that we're we're looking at, or the GP LEDs that we're looking at. You know, and there, I mean, we've had, we've had a rising market, a significantly rising market for the last uh, 12, you know, 12 plus months. So um, valuations are, are probably high on a historical level. At least we would think they're, they're quite frothy right now. Um, so what that means for, for a buyer um, is we just need to be very thoughtful about, um, you know, how much we're paying for assets, how, how that looks historically, how that might trend at exit in terms of will there be multiple compression um, and, 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 and frankly, it just it makes it harder for us to go out there and find opportunities that we think there are real value for our LPs. But that's something that we we obviously have a big team and we spend a lot of time doing. Great. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit now and Peter turn to you. Uh, we've talked a little bit about a healthy market, a rising market. Um, I'd ask you to share your thoughts on, you know, general market observations and how what's happening in the primary market is impacting on the secondary market at a broader level. Thank you, Stephen. The growth of the uh, primary market in the last uh, decade has been truly remarkable. According to Prequin, the AUM uh, in private equity has grown from $2.7 trillion in 2010 to $8.5 trillion in 2020. That's a really rapid growth. And 
since the financial during the financial crisis, I would say that the LPs were the one primarily driving the secondaries market as they needed liquidity as they rebalance their portfolio and prepare for for uh, the financial crisis where the distribution distribution start drying up. But more over the last few years is also the GPs that are needing liquidity that is leading to the GP led uh, secondaries market that has been the fastest growing sub secondaries market. So clearly, as the private market evolves more rapidly, the secondaries market is getting more sophisticated and is driving the growth. Great. Thanks, Peter. And I'm going to come back to you shortly uh, when we go for a slightly deeper dive on what's happening in Asia. Um, but before we do that, uh, Francois, uh, we just heard from Peter talking a little bit about, uh, you know, a healthy and very vibrant growing primary market. Um, you know, what does that mean in, in terms of uh, secondary funds? Because obviously we've seen a record level of fundraising on the back of that growth in the market for secondary funds. Um, are volumes keeping pace with fundraising? You know, is the market in, in balance or is it overweight either side? Yeah, look, it's it's a fair question and it's a question that we get um, very often from uh, from investors because they want to make sure that there is not excess capacity on the buy side. Um, but interestingly, what we see today is sometimes we call it a balanced market. Uh, it really feels to me like a bias market. Uh, if you phone today any single intermediary from uh, the secondary market, they will tell you that their key struggle is to get enough capital in light of uh, the pipeline that they have for secondary investments, whether it is GP led or uh, sometimes as well on the uh, on the LP led uh, side. So, um, so there is, um, it's not surprising that there's been a record fundraising um, mark uh, for our market, because if you think about it, the market has been growing consistently for the last few decades. And so by definition, if you continue to grow, um, you will year after year hit new records. Um, so, so this is, uh, this is the nature of the evolution of, uh, of the market, um, but uh, transactions are still growing faster than the fundraising itself. Before we turn to Peter to share some thoughts on the secondary market in Asia, just a reminder of the ask a question function. We've already had a number of questions come through. Uh, you'll see that on the screens. Uh, please don't be shy um, and uh, happy to receive more questions. Uh, let's turn to uh, Asia now. Uh, and Peter, um, this market, um, where are we? Is it finally taking off? Is it delivering the promise that we expected? Yes, I think uh, there's a marked, markedly difference between last year, from last year and this year. Uh, we really see that uh, the Asian secondaries market is really starting to take off. Uh, and I think the, the main reason is because we're starting to see higher quality of assets as well, as well as higher quality of GPs. Um, and, and the reason behind that, in my, in my view, is that about 10 years ago, uh, Asian GP started to raise uh, billion plus dollar funds. And it's, it's now we're entering a stage where Asian GPs are starting to raise 10 billion plus dollar funds. And clearly about 10 years ago, when they start raising their fund two, three, four, that's been a billion dollar, they start having a better quality of assets, more proven GPs. And the transaction from these GPs are starting to come out finally uh, through the secondaries in Asia. So in terms of deal volume um, as well, there are a lot more investable uh, secondaries opportunities from a global perspective in Asia than before. So very much a healthy, vibrant, growing market. Are there any specific trends or themes, either regional or otherwise, Peter, that uh, you want to uh, alight on? Yes, Stephen. Here in Asia, one of the key driving uh, uh, factor that affects private equity market and general environment is the uh, geopolitical tension, particularly between the US and China or the Western with China. So what we're starting to see more and more is that many Chinese GP used to invest in companies, even their own Chinese companies with the intention to IPO uh, in the US. We're starting to see all of those IPOs being pulled back. So um, delayed in distribution potentially and reconsidering being listed in Hong Kong. 
And I think that's a big impact on, on generally how people approach the market. Also, there's been a big trend where Chinese GPs have been buying global or Western assets with the intention to bring it to China and ultimately then sell it to Chinese trade firm, a trade buyout. Now, clearly with, uh, again, uh, geopolitical tension, we see some of these assets not being able to uh, be sold uh, in their original intention. So, um, so some of the GPs are starting to re rethink and re reevaluate, reevaluate their uh, investment strategy. Uh, because of this, we also see more GP-led situation coming out from the region, um, and that's where we think uh, it's quite exciting at the moment. Great, uh, must be a fantastic time to be on the ground in Asia, uh, and good luck to you and the team. Um, before we move to Q and A, uh, I'm going to ask Francois to. Uh, give us uh, his or the firm's thoughts for 2022 and beyond uh, with a very open-ended question of, um, well, what's the next stage for secondaries? Yeah, so I think, look, what the next stage uh, is probably a webinar in itself because there is um, so much growth and there are so many opportunities, uh, I think, for this market moving forward. But if I stick to um, two specific elements, the first one back to the growth to put in context, um, there is no reason again, that this market should not be a quarter, then half a trillion, then at some point a trillion as well, um, just because it is catching up with the primary market because the primary markets uh, are growing very, very strongly. Um, the, um, the only question around timing of, of when that happens, again, is not related to the supply. It will be related to how quickly all of the managers, specialized managers in this market are able to raise the capital to then invest and provide liquidity. Uh, so very, very strong growth, uh, strong tailwind uh, for all of us, uh, which is which is great, of course. Um, the other elements which I think will be um, short term, very visible will be um, continued diversification effectively. Uh, you know, for a long time, we used to be the private equity secondary markets. I think very soon we will have to drop uh, that name and to become the private markets uh, secondaries um, because there, there has been a clear takeoff in some um, segments such as infrastructure, real estate, we see that now with credit as well. Um, so, uh, so it will be a much more global um, phenomenon, a liquidity solution, liquidity solution, sorry, for all private markets. Francois, thanks for those thoughts. And there's certainly plenty of material for our next webinar. Uh, we're now going to continue with the Q&A section of this one. However, as I mentioned earlier, we've already received a number of questions uh, from you. Uh, so thank you to those of you that have submitted them. Uh, we're going to start with a question about sellers, first of all, uh, uh, Francois, I'm going to pick on you again. Um, and to talk us through um, seller type, seller composition, um, do you see that changing in the coming few years? No, look, it's um, in a way, it's a very simple question, yes or no, binary. Um, and the answer is also, in my view, fairly simple. It's uh, yes and no. And what I mean by that is, um, if I start with the no, you have now a number of uh, institutions with large private equity programs used to come uh, back to market every two, three, four years um, with an active portfolio management of their, uh, of their private equity or private asset portfolios. And, um, and so those institutions will continue to be a significant proportion of the supply in the market. So from that standpoint, the sellers will not change. What is interesting, however, is to, um, and if you apologize for the, the numbers I'm going to quote because they are potentially not accurate, but directionally correct. Um, you've had, I think, an increase of maybe um, something like five, 5,000 LPs in the market a few years ago, going up to eight or 9,000 LPs in the market, private assets today. Um, and so those LPs will be new entrants in the singles market as sellers as their portfolio matures and as themselves, uh, they start to uh, use the market. Not necessarily a very different type of investors, uh, but more of them, so new sellers. Uh, what we will see, I think as well, uh, because a lot of uh, capital has come into uh, the private assets through uh, private banks in particular. So I would be very surprised if we don't see also supply coming from those organizations um, when at some point they uh, decide to provide a liquidity service to some of their high net worth individual clients, 
Uh, so probably uh, probably a few of those uh, of those transactions as well coming. Great, thank you, um, Paul. I'm going to come to you shortly because uh, we've had a very interesting question come through about challenges in the market and some of the obstacles for future growth. But before doing that, uh, Peter, uh, I want to come to you and turn to you and ask you a question about specialization. Uh, and the question is, should we expect more specialization on the buy side? Yes, um, thank you. As, as the secondary, as we talked about for the last um, um, half an hour or so, it is very clear that secondary market is growing fast, is getting more sophisticated, and it's expanding in various different types of strategies. So I think it's just natural that investors of secondaries would also start to seek for a different type of uh, secondaries managers or, or, uh, or focused firms. And we're already starting to see here in Asia uh, where some investors want healthcare secondaries managers or tech secondaries managers and so forth, as well as different types of uh, secondaries manager focused on different stages. So VC focused or buyout focused. So as our market continued to grow, just like what we've seen in a private uh, primary market, we also see expect to see some specialization between our secondary fund as well. Thanks, Peter. And uh, Paul, hopefully given you uh, enough time to, for your uh, thinking cap to be done. Uh, challenges uh, and obstacles for future growth. Sure. Um, well, I think you've heard both Peter and, and Francois uh, comment on how this market has, has continued to grow. And if you look back, it's, it's and, and we expect it to continue to grow. If you look back over you know the last twenty years or so, it's it's been you know very consistent growth. The market is getting bigger. The private private uh, assets, uh, the number of private assets is growing, and, and the number of those assets that trade on the secondary market um, is growing. You know, the two interruptions that in that growth over the last 20 years or so have been 2009 and then again in 2020. So, you know, and, and, that, and that was market related and if the market declines, you tend to see secondary market, secondary volume slow up for a bit, but then it resumes and oftentimes it resumes at, at even a faster pace. So, you know, the one, the one challenge to growth is just, do, is there a market correction in the future? Your, your guess is as good as mine. Um, but obviously, if, if the market were to trade down, the, the market would, the growth in the secondary market would slow, but, but that would likely be temporary and, and, and we expect the market to continue to grow significantly from here. Um, you know, the, the other challenge to, to growth, I think, ties a bit in with, with what Peter was just talking about. Um, it, this is, a, it's becoming a more complex market, right? With, with GP LEDs, um, the, the investments are getting more complicated. They're, they're getting more concentrated. They're, it requires some level of specialization. Um, so having a deep bench of talent on your investment team is critical to finding the best opportunities and taking advantage of those for your LPs. Finding talent, finding investment talent in this market is hard, right? We, we have a big team. Uh, we'd like that team to be even bigger going forward. Um, but, but there is, a, there is a war for talent out there. So, so I think that is, that's one of the obstacles that we're all dealing with on a daily basis right now is just making sure that, that we, we have a, a very high quality team able to continue to evaluate what is a, a very robust market. And that's always a sign of a, of a healthy market as we've discussed throughout uh, today. Um, I'm going to close on the final question to you, Francois. Um, market, the next five years, is it going to be fundamentally different from what it is today? And if so, how? So I have to say that sharing my crystal ball with you know hundreds of people watching that webinar is not particularly comfortable. Um, but but that being said, um, I think I think what uh, we should expect uh, for the next five years. I've mentioned it, and an apology for repetition, but you know, bigger, bigger, bigger in any sense of the world. It's about the transaction volume. It's about uh, the number of people who work in this industry. Surprisingly, we've had very few uh, new entrants in this um, in this industry for the last 20 years. I don't see that changing materially. There are, there are real barriers to entries in this in this industry. So I think all of us will be much bigger. I think what will potentially not change much as well will be returns. If you think, um, for those who remember, after the GFC, uh, what we heard was um, the returns for the private equity industry in general will go down materially 
this has not been the case. It is a smart industry where people do manage to find the right uh, setups, the right sectors, uh, the right um, structures as well to, uh, to maintain uh, value creation and to create returns. And I think we will continue to benefit from that as a secondary industry on top of the premium that we get for providing a service, which is, you know, liquidity service to, um, to market participants. So I think, uh, I think returns will, um, we hold, uh, but again, much bigger. Great. You hit it here first and several times, bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, that brings us to uh, the end of uh, the questions. Um, if you submitted one, which we didn't get a chance to answer, please bear with us. Uh, we'll come back to you by email as soon as possible. Um, all that remains for me is to say thank you uh, to you, the audience, and also thank you to Francois, Peter and Paul uh, for giving their time, sharing their views on the market. Um, I think you will all agree that in the aftermath of COVID-19, um, the secondary market is in a fantastic place. Uh, it's incredibly dynamic. And as the market continues to rebound, um, it will continue to strive and reach for new records. Uh, you can tell that we're very excited by the market's prospects and uh, hope you share in our enthusiasm too. All that remains for me to say is uh, thank you for joining us today and of course, take care.